Good morning. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we just finished up a series uh, last time I talked, and we're going to begin a new one today. I'm going to be talking on a subject, and I'll be developing it and going through it, and I, I want to call it prophetic ministry. Uh, in other words, how we live a prophetic lifestyle. Um, when we think of the Old Testament, like in 1 Samuel 19, it's, I'm not going to read it. You, you can read it on your own if you like, but it, it's about um, Samuel. And he was, a, of course, we know Samuel was a prophet. And he gathered around him other prophets. And when they got together, there would be uh, the presence of God would come amongst them. And this story in 1 Samuel 19 is about when uh, David, he joined the prophets and then uh, Saul sent some people, some of his soldiers to go get him. Well, they couldn't get him because they just never had a good excuse. They come back to Saul and they say, well, we saw him, but they, I don't know what they said. They just said they never came back with David. So Saul went to get him himself. And, the, and as uh, Saul finally finds him, he sees off in a distance Samuel and the prophets and they're prophesying and he also sees David. So he goes towards them with the idea of getting David. And all of a sudden he falls to the ground, begins to prophesy, <clears throat> but he's overcome by the presence of God. And so in the Old Testament, when the prophet, the prophets got together, the presence of God would come down upon them and they'd walk along prophesying. That is a, that is a forerunner of what is to happen today in the church. Now today, it says we all can prophesy. Now I want to make very clear as I start this that anybody who prophesies, that does not make them a prophet. Don't, please don't misunderstand me here and try to draw from this what I'm going to be talking about that, uh, that all people who prophesy are prophets. That's not true. But all believers are to prophesy. Every believer has the ability to prophesy. And so, so prophecy is very important. I will say... In, in churches, uh, if you want to see a prophetic people, it's very helpful to have a prophet around who will be around, who will be with them, and the people will begin to take on uh, the effects of the prophet being around them, and they'll begin to move towards being a prophetic people by just being around a prophet or around a company of prophets. Um, now, does that mean you have to have a prophet around for the prophetic to take uh, uh, place? I don't think so. Uh, but I think it's helpful, but as God's people begin to learn how to prophesy, they begin to cause the environment to be as such where prophecy can flow amongst God's people. So today I want to talk about, um, since we're going into, I'm going to be talking about the New Testament, we're going to be broadening from the Old Testament where it was just a group of the prophets that, that that prophesied. Now we're going to be coming into the New Testament where it's going to be all believers can prophesy. Um, so I want to talk about uh, the person who's prophesying and a very important motivation, and that is love. Love is very important. Now, we, when we go back to Scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the gifts. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about uh, how to use some of these gifts. Uh, and then chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians is sandwiched right in the middle of 12 and 14, and it's the whole chapter about love. So we, we can see that the foundation of prophetic ministry is what does God think of you? And, and we must learn because God loved us, then we can love ourselves. And, and so, this, so it becomes very important in how we view ourselves. How do we see God viewing us and how do, what kind of view do we have ourselves? We know that God loves us, so it's important that we love ourselves because we become, each person becomes the focal point from which prophecy flows. So it's going to flow out of you according to how you view yourself and, if you, and how deeply you love yourself. Um, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it says, to pursue, to pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So we can see the, the, the prerequisite to prophesy is to pursue love. So love is the heart of the prophetic ministry. Love is to be pursued. Pursued means, and it's to be pursued before ministry. Please don't 
let your ministry become the most important thing in your life. That is, that's, you're, you're making it too important. Love needs to be what's really important. Love is what, uh, the word pursue here, to pursue love means to hunt. It means to, you have to have love. It's like a survival mode. You, you've got to know, uh, you've got to be moving in love if you expect the words that come out of your mouth to come from the right motivation. Now, the greatest commandment is to love. If you love God, you understand that he loves you. This, the natural, this natural results in loving your neighbor as yourself because you, have, because you will value them as much as God values you. So the correlation here is, first and foremost, is do you realize that God loves you? Do you know God loves you deeply? And if you do, then from that premise, you can then, from that platform, then you can love people because you first know God loves you. And you then can love your neighbor as you love yourself. Um, what happens in the prophetic ministry if, if love is not at the focus, if love is not at the central, the platform of your prophetic ministry, then you're not going to have people in mind. Your concern is not for people. And as a result, you will, you will try to, you become a false prophet and you'll, you'll, you'll try to draw people around you uh, because you lack the understanding of the love of God's towards you. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is how do we pastor people in the prophetic? Um, now we must, we must, we, when we prophesy, we have to make sure our motivation is correct. So as we're pastoring or we're, as, as we are, as we have the opportunity to prophesy into somebody's life, we have to make sure we're looking at this correctly. I have the opportunity to help somebody. And that, that comes from love. We're trying to benefit others. I'm not prophesying to exalt myself. That's not the purpose of prophesying. My purpose of prophesying is not to become the best person to prophesy or to produce the greatest prophet, the, uh, the best prophecies. That's not the purpose of prophesying. The purpose of prophesying is I, in my heart, I want to I want to see the person I'm going to prophesy to be affected and moved by the love of God. And that that should be that should be what my that should be what I'm after. It's always about people. It's not about me. It's not in, in, for example, if I'm going to prophesy over somebody, my my motivation should not turn toward it should not turn toward me and to how well I prophesy. If that's going on, then I then uh, I, I'm, I'm functioning out of my gift rather than, than towards people, rather than seeing people, number one, and trying to get and trying to help them. Now, what is your identity in? Now, when you're prophesying, is your identity in your gift? If it is in your gift, the problem with that is that when you don't feel close to the Lord, maybe you're not hearing his voice, then you'll, you'll begin to lose heart uh, because it's in your gift. And, and our identity needs to come from what we are in what we are in Christ. This is a very important. Let me say this again: our identity comes from finding who we are in Christ. Now we have to know what what has Jesus accomplished for us, not because of us, but because of what Jesus accomplished. What has he accomplished for us? I want to read some, I just want to read some scripture. This is in Ephesians chapter one, verses two through five. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in every, in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, in the pra in praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. So we can, as, I, as you read through those verses, you can see this, this has nothing to do what, with what I've accomplished. No. It has to do with what Jesus has accomplished for me. And I need to understand that. I need to realize because that begins to put me on the right track 
to be able to prophesy into people's lives. Now, in the in one I just read there, just highlighting certain things in there, one of the first things it brings up is because I'm in Christ, I've set myself up. I've lined myself up to be blessed. I I. I've lined myself up for spiritual blessings from the heavenly places to flow into my life. I've also realized that because I'm in Christ, he chose me. He ch I, didn't chose, I didn't choose him. He chose me. He came after me. And he, he's working because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. His very intention is, is because I'm in Christ is I'm holy and I'm blameless. And I've been adopted as one of his sons. I'm part of the family. This all has to do with what Jesus has accomplished. Um, and when you read on in, in other places, it says that we are righteous. We've been given a gift of righteousness and he's declared it as so, and he's put his grace upon us. And again, I just, I can't emphasize this enough. That has, this has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Jesus and then me believing in Christ. And then he, he bestows or he puts on me these blessings, the gift of righteousness, holiness, and he gives these things to me. Another one is in Romans 8.37. It says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So this is, again, a part about being in Christ. And it's God's intention for us, and he, and he declares it so. In other words, this is, this, is, this is a fact. He says, you are more than a conqueror. And that, that, has to, that is so important because, because when we go, we go through difficult times, it doesn't feel like I'm more than a conqueror, but Christ said, because I'm in him, I'm more than a conqueror. So then I can turn my negative situation around for good because I know God's intention towards me. And it's all been accomplished because Jesus, because what happens to me being in Christ because of what he accomplished on the cross. Um, what are some ways to pastor the prophetic? It's very important when people are, when, uh, people are struggling in the prophetic that they understand that they're a receiver. We, it's also it's important to understand that God is constantly speaking and we just have to listen. We have to open, turn, put our antenna up and seek him out and, and begin to listen so we can be encouraged by what God is saying. Sometimes people may ask, how do I know if what I'm hearing is really the voice of God? My, my answer to that is, if, you're, if you are developing an intimate relationship with the Lord, which we are told to do, that as I develop that, I am going to automatically start hearing his voice. You'll be able to hear his voice in a crowd of, in a crowd of people because there's an intimacy, there's a closeness that you have with God, and you've learned that voice through, through developing this friendship with him. Also, that um, how do I know it's the voice of God? It should always be congruent with the Word of God it, it, and with the Bible. Uh, we have to be careful when we're, we're um, pastoring God's people through the prophetic is not to judge them. Um, and, we, and, and we cannot expect people to move out in the prophetic if we are not going to do that. So never practice hypocrisy. If we're wanting people to prophesy, then whoever's talking to them, whoever's explaining it to them, then you must step out and you must prophesy as well. Now you have to be careful when you when you're engaging with people to prophesy. You're encouraging them to prophesying and to hear to hear the voice of the Lord. And the most simplest form of prophesying is is repeating what God is telling you. And so as we do this, and now what we have to be careful of next is competition. The um, the problem with competition is when we're not grounded in love, and we're we're competing in the prophetic is that we, our words, my words, my prophetic word has to be the best. And, and, and when that's going on, we're leaving out the, mo the motivation of the prophetic again is love. We're leading, we're leaving that out. And our, then our focus gets on us and how important we are and how, how good of a word we got. And so when somebody speaks a prophetic word and it seemingly seems to be better than ours, then we become discouraged. Well, that's because we're in the, we have the wrong motivation. And so the, these are things that happen to people as they start to learn to move in the prophetic. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't bad, but we just have to learn and, and to increase in our knowledge and understanding and how to move in the prophetic. Um, we, we, we can love because God first loved us. We must understand that God loves us unconditionally. 
He loves us. Um, his love for us doesn't wane according to what's going on. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, go up and down. It's consistent. Now, if we are trying to pro prophesy according to performance, then we're again, we're moving in the wrong uh, motivation. It, it's not on performance. It's again, we got to focus on the people, the people that we're prophesying over. We have to catch a burden for those people. We have to listen to what they're saying make sure we understand what it is we're prophesying about, then listen to the Holy Spirit, to what he wants to tell them, and then we'll be motivated, we'll be moved by the Holy Spirit to prophesy over them. Now see, that has to do with, all of that has to do with the person. It has nothing to do with us. We are just an instrument that God moves through to bless people. And we, want, we just want to give ourselves to God to do that. Now, another thing that we want to develop is, uh, as I talk about prophetic ministry, is the prophetic ministry is not something that's to be an add-on in the church. It is to be a culture. Now, let me explain it this way. Back in the 50s and 60s, uh, in our houses, we had air, um, air, most people had window air conditioning units. So they, they put these in their, in their windows, certain rooms of the house. And so certain rooms are cooler than others. Certain rooms are hot. And in order to be comfortable, you, you, if you were staying in a room, you, you had to adjust your clothing, either more clothes or less clothes. Or, um, and if you were in a room where the air conditioning unit was, you had to be, you probably, you may have put on more clothes. During those years, a lot of people, when it was really hot, they would go, and we did, we have, I have five kids and we, in, in the peak of the summer when it got really hot, we'd sleep in the room where the air conditioning unit was. But now most houses have central air. And so all rooms are comfortable. And so that's the way it is with the prophetic. It's gotta be something that's a culture. It's not an add-on. It's, it's not like an air conditioning unit in one room. Now the prophetic culture is also for our community. It's for the church. And we got to have the right values of the kingdom in order to move in the power of this ministry. We should never demonstrate the power of the kingdom without the virtues of the kingdom. Now, it's very important we understand what the virtues of the kingdom are. And I'm going to be getting into more of that. Um, okay, I want to read something here. It says, if you prophesied over someone and got the words perfectly right, but the people did not feel the love of God, you didn't prophesy right. Your first, your first responsibility is to extend the love of God. The nine gifts of the Spirit in, in 1 Corinthians 12 are the love languages of the Spirit. So we have to, we have to be sure that we're ministering for, again from love. Um, there are many people on the earth who've been delivered. And, they, and I've seen this happen. They're delivering and people yell at them. They raise their voice and it becomes a very traumatic time. Then most, a lot of those people that have been delivered had to be delivered of the deliverance. And so we have to be careful on how that we're using kingdom values and how they, and how they affect the prophetic ministry. In Luke 8.18, it says, to, it says this, So take care how you listen. For whoever has to him more will be given and whoever does not have even what he thinks he has will be taken away how you listen is determined by your basic values in other words the value the things that are really that you you shaped your life by is 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 what determines how you listen um, and let me read in john 8 31 through 32 it it, it, it builds this subject it goes on it says jesus was saying to those jews who had believed in him. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, the word truth here means reality. Now, so your, our basic values are the lenses, are the eyes of our heart. Your eyes are the windows, but you see with your heart. We often question what we see and hear, but we seldom question how we see it or hear it. We think that how we see how we see is reality. We should question our reality. Now, if we have scratches on our lenses, which are eyes by the windows that go to our heart, then we're going to see things according to the scratches, and then, and and so that we have to learn to minister from a different reality. So things have to be changed. Our values have to change, and can they be altered? Yes, they can be. 
will see that the world, you, you'll not see the world as it is, but you'll see it as you are. So we have to, we have to check our own selves, make sure that, that we have the right value system so we're seeing things accurately. The things, the things that we see with our eyes are directly related back to our heart. And, and if we have the wrong lenses, we have the wrong value system, then we're not really seeing the true reality. We're seeing a virtual reality. We're seeing a different, a fake reality. And so there are, there are boundaries that are set on our behavior. So all of our friendships, our family relationships, our business dealings, and all these become in, into a conflict because our values referee us. Our values are the profits of our destiny. They dictate what we allow ourselves to desire. They decide what is important to accomplish in our lives. Our values determine the way we see God. So our values answer questions years before they're asked. They make choices, therefore, to know that they make choices for us before we know what the outcome will be. We tend to see the world not in the way that it is, but in the way that we are. So the focus is coming back on us. We have to make sure we have the right value system. We prophesy out of our values, our basic values. This is this is why makes this what this is what makes so important that we have the right values. Because if we don't, if we don't have kingdom values, then we're prophesying out of a set of values that don't line up with kingdom, and 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 we're we're prophesying wrong things to people. Um, I want whoever Jesus is to you, he'll be that through you to other people. I want to, I want to, and to illustrate that, I want to read in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one other of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say then? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. I also, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's better... The scriptures I just read to you, it's a better illustrator, translates as, who do you, who am I to you? So when the, when the disciples were responding and they were saying, some say you're Jeremiah, some say, you know, you're a prophet. This was how they were seeing Jesus. And they, they were basing that on their own value system, their basic value, the core value in their life. And so these values become extremely important in how we see things. So we have to go back and make sure we have kingdom values. Now I'm going to stop there. I'm going to pick up in the next session, hitting more on the kingdom values. Thank you very much.